one of these days I'll, I'll manage to do that. Um, interesting what he just said. We were having an interns meeting today. Well, half of the interns were on some uh, Princess Trust training course. But for those who were around, we had a meeting. And we, we okay, um, don't laugh. We agreed that I asked them, what's the oldest you think I am? What's the oldest you think I can be? And, uh, no, I mean, right now, at this point in time. <laughs> you know, and we agreed that 40 is pretty much, okay. That's what we agreed. That's what the consensus was, that that's the oldest, you know. So, I said, what, what's the youngest you think I'm likely going to leave the earth? We agreed that 75 was a worst case scenario. Pardon? Yeah, so we said, okay. Minimum, someone say minimum. minimum. Say minimum. minimum. Minimum, I've got another 35 years on earth. Satan, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, my dear. And I was talking about generational planning. I said, so, by the time, if, if I was, and I don't plan to leave at 75, trust me. I plan to see four generations minimum, Amen. I know if Jesus tarries, I'll be at least 80. I know because I saw a vision of myself once at over 80. So I one of those guys wanted to go very early, you know, do your thing, bam, bam, and go. But I saw over 80, so I'm stuck here for another, you know. <laughs> do I look wet behind the ears, Sammy? <laughs> I'm not 80, but I'm not 18. Um, and I, so I, I, I said, you know what? How, how many people do you think by the time, you know, at least or at most, whichever one, 35 years from now, by the time I'm 75, if, if I've done my job and I've raised, it's actually started by talking about winning souls. I'll come up, come back and preach about winning souls. Uh, but just know this, the soul is a mind, the memory, sorry, the mind, the will, and the emotion, including the memory and the imagination. So when you say you've won a soul, it's a lot more than just getting them to say a sinner's prayer. I, I, can't, I don't have time to explain that today, but the concept of winning souls goes way beyond evangelism. Because if you win a soul, I mean, we talked about, I'll give you a five-second preview. So to win something, there must be an opposition and a battle, right? So who is the opposition? The Bible talk tells us about, uh, about the Holy Spirit coming to judge and all those things. And we see three realms of warfare for the believer. There's the flesh. Someone say the flesh. The spirit realm or the devil and his, and his people. And then there's the world. So the system of the world, the flesh of the sin nature, and then the enemy, the s Satan himself. When we say we're winning a soul, it means there are things that want to win the soul from us. And the enemy, the devil, demons, you know, fallen angels are fighting for the mind, the will, and the emotions. Flesh, sin, amen. Talk to me, someone. Is fighting for the mind, will, and emotions. And so when we say we win a soul, we're not just ask, telling them a cute story and saying, get saved. Does that make sense? Talk to me, someone. Am I talking? Can I go sit down, you guys? What is searching for something, talking to someone else? Winning souls is the purpose of the gospel of the kingdom. But it goes beyond evangelism. It's a lifelong process. It means we partner with God, receive grace from him. To wrestle the soul of an individual from flesh, from sin, from carnal thinking, and not wrestle it unto ourselves, but deliver it unto God. Because that's part of the problem. When we win souls, we win them into a culture, we win them into a denomination, we win them into a ministry, we have thinking. And therefore, the Bible says, if a strong man keeps his goods, they are safe until a stronger than he comes. Satan and the enemy, the world, the flesh, the sin nature is stronger than you in your own power. So if you want someone sold to your own ideology, when Satan comes looking for what he lost, he will get it back. Amen. The only place a person's soul is safe from, you know, returning is in Christ. But different story for a different day. So we talked about the fact that our assignment is to win souls. And we looked at over 35 years. Right now, at this point in time, at least 100 people on the surface of the earth, see EKM as their home, at least. Um, we said if everyone were to win three souls a year, just three souls a year, if everyone were to be used by God to disciple three souls a year, 
in 12 years, there would be a billion and a half people in the house. And I don't mean bearing a church's name. No, I mean in the household of God. Whether or not they go to our church or not. If each person won three souls a year, and then the three souls won three and three, you know. So basically, meaning if each person, if one person became four per year, if there was a fourfold increase in kingdom people per year. In 12 years, by the 13th year, there would be 1 billion 500 million people in the God house. Someone say, wow. If each person won one soul per year, meaning if instead of multiplying by four, it was by two, by the 20-something year, there would be about 800 and something million. And then if each person, if, if, if it was one point, mainly if each person, if out of three people, only one person won a soul per year, it would end up being by the 35th year, there'd be about, I can't remember now, like five million or one, whatever it is. If each person wins three souls a year for the kingdom of God, 12 years from then, starting with 100 people, you'd have a billion and a half. If each person wins one soul, by 20-something years, you'd have one billion. Even if it's as bad as one in three, you'd still have about, I mean, if, 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 you told, but if I told you today that in 35 years' time, your church would have over a million people, would you, would you be like, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good deal. That's just one in three. Think about that. That's just one in three. Now, if you had a hundred churches in the world with a hundred people, Helena, so I want to talk to you about today. So I want to say multiply. Say multiply. Okay, uh, we're gonna pray. So I'm gonna run through this very quickly. Uh, trust me, I, I mean it when I say quick. This is not one of my Pauline messages. No one's going to fall off the roof and break their head because I preach too long and I have to raise them up. You know, Paul's a very bad dude. The Bible says he was preaching so long, a guy fell asleep in the window, fell down from the second floor, cracked his skull. Paul went down, healed him coming, raised him back to life, and went on preaching. I mean, tell me about it. Tasha, imagine. The guy put him back together. And went on preaching. If I was a guy who fell, I'd be like, hey, sweet. Once beaten, forever shy. <laughs> I'm off. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to run through some things. I don't have time to give you the scriptures now. Um, the New Testament tells us that we have a new covenant. I don't, and I said, go, go study your Bible. Go find the scriptures yourself. I'm going to run through quickly. The New Testament tells us that we have a new covenant established upon better promises. Someone say better promises. Keep in mind, we're dealing with the concept of new creation realities, what we have available to us in Christ. We have a new covenant. Someone say new covenant. In fact, it says a better covenant. Someone say better. Now, the word better means there is a comparison. If, if I tell you Sammy is taller, then you want to find out who is... The person had better be short. Love you, Sammy. If I tell you um, someone is taller than Pastor Steve Tutu, then I want to know who that. <laughs> he tells me he has a, a, a nephew who's two inches taller than him. I thought, Lord have mercy. You know, this is tall dudes, you know, make you feel like midget, you know. But we bless God. Anyone taller than me is too tall. Anyone shorter than me is too short. Anyone fatter than me is too fat. Anyone thinner than me is too thin. I'm perfect. Everyone should tell themselves that every day. Amen. Good. Better prom meaning, now if you study the old covenant, it was pretty deep. It was the old covenant that said you'd be the head, not the tail. It was the old covenant that said you'd be the first, not the last. It was the old covenant that said you would lend and not borrow. It was the old covenant who said you would not die but live. It was the old covenant who said, so me and my house. See, all the 
I mean, if you serve the Lord, he'll bless, take my gain up a little bit. He'll bless your bread and your water and, and he'll take away sickness from the midst of you and none will be barren or cast their young. It was the old covenant that said God would teach you how to, how, to, how, to, how to profit. It was the old covenant who said he'd give you the power to get wealth. I mean, that old covenant was pretty decent. But the Bible says we have a better one. Founded upon better promises. First Peter, second Peter, sorry, chapter one tells us that we have received, amen, amen, the ability by these promises to be a partaker of the divine nature. Someone say the divine nature. Meaning God has given us, now the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant was, in the old covenant, God gave us himself by addition. In the new covenant, he gives of himself by replacement. In the old covenant, it was God with you. In the new covenant, it is God in you. Hello. In the old covenant, God came and did for you. In the new covenant, God comes and does through you. Are you with me, somebody? The difference between the, see, between the old and the new covenant primarily is this. Summarized. The Bible says, this is the summary of the new covenant. Christ in you. Someone say, in me. Say, in me. Say, the hope of glory. Say, I have hope for glory. This will not ever be my story. Say, this will not ever be my story. Come on, put your hand on your heart. Say, this will not ever be my story. There is Christ in me, my hope of glory. One more time, this will not forever be my story. Because of Christ inside me my hope of glory one more time this will not forever be my story i have christ in me he is the hope of my glory do you believe that if you believe shout okay bible says that we have the ability to be partakers of a divine nature to partake means to be involved in, to eat, to digest, to, to receive. Someone say partakers of the divine nature. You know, and uh, uh, there's a message I preached a while back. I don't know if we still have the CDs or it's on YouTube called the partakers of the divine nature. Now, you must understand something. These promises, the Bible says they are better than the old covenant, which was deep by itself. It says these promises when we now, this is the beauty. These promises have the potential. Listen to me, somebody. They have the potential to make us divine. Now, we, people get their panties in a bunch, and with good reason, I must add, when preachers talk about us being gods. I understand why people are a bit funny, you know, because, it, I mean, we are not, so I don't, I'm not going I'm, I'm to, not, I'm not saying that you are a god, no. Because I've heard people preach about being a small g, and while I understand where they're coming from, uh, people who don't, if you don't, if you take it literally, then the people who have a problem with it have a point. So, I, I like to use the phrase son of God. I mean, that's very biblical, isn't it? Okay. Now, if you're the son of God, then it means that while you might not be God or a God, you're not a normal human being. Can we agree on that? The Bible says that you can become divine. Think about that. Not divine in your ability to be worshipped but divine in the manifestation of a different life form through you. Are you with me? But these promises don't work except through faith. It is by grace that we are saved through faith. Someone say faith. Faith. Without faith, it is impossible for anyone to connect with God. The new covenant works by faith. Salvation works by faith. Amen. You had to believe in your heart before you, if you didn't believe in your heart, confessing made no difference. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Why? Yeah, because my pastor said so. Fail. Someone say fail. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Why? Because my mommy will kill me if I don't answer this altar call. Fail. It gets worse. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Why? Because my girlfriend is a Christian and if I don't give my life to Christ, she won't date me. Someone say, F -f 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 fail. That's a you, ungraded. You know, there's different levels of failure. 
a D, where, I don't know, I mean, you know, where I come from, a D was a failure. I mean, I know in this day and age, you know, but a D was a failure. An E was woeful. An F, you didn't go home. And if you got a U, you committed suicide. And then you resurrected yourself back to life. Amen. Jokes apart. But you get my point. It takes faith. Someone say faith. faith. To activate the promises of the New Testament or covenant. Testament means covenant. Are you with me? Are you with me? Are you with me? The father of faith. The, the old covenant was based on the fact that you were a descendant of Abraham. Are you with me? Even the new covenant, the Bible says, if you are Christ's, Galatians, that you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The Bible says of Abraham, he believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Meaning it was his faith that made him qualified for the covenant. The Jews told Jesus, our father is Abraham. Jesus says, no, 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 no. The fact that you're a physical descendant of Abraham doesn't qualify you for the promise. If you don't do the works of Abraham, meaning if you don't exercise faith like Abraham did. Now, what is faith? Faith is not this beautiful, wonderful, spurious, spooky thing. Mm, 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 mm. No, no, no. Faith is simple. The Bible says it comes. Some say it comes. Say so you can't work faith up. Tell your neighbor, you can't work faith up. It just comes. Some say it comes. Notice it doesn't say it goes. Thank God faith is ever coming, never going. Someone say faith comes. Amen. And I'm having faith for my rotator cuff shoulder after bench pressing for the first time in 10 years yesterday in the gym. I got to the gym. I was taking my little, my little weights, feeling cool, you know. And I met this person I've known for, I, I know who was, you know, I thought, oh, Lord. He looked all buff and chiseled and like, oh, pastor, let me spot you, I thought. So because I didn't want to look like a wimp, okay, go on. <laughs> Thank you. But anyway, so, uh, amen. Uh -huh. Faith comes. You see, what the Bible means is when you hear, you will have faith. Simple. That, that, that's what that verse means. Faith comes by hearing. It means if you hear, not listen, but hear. There's a difference. You can listen without hearing. God takes complete receipt. Isn't it beautiful that in the new covenant, God takes responsibility for almost everything except you just hearing. If you hear, the Bible says, how shall they be saved unless they hear? Meaning if they hear, they'll be saved. And how shall they hear unless someone preaches? And now shall they preach unless they are sent. Don't preach if you're not sent. Amen. But the Bible says that we have all been sent. Go into all the... Okay, but you get the point I'm trying to make. Faith comes by hearing. Meaning if you lack faith, all you need to do is make sure you hear. How do you hear? Hearing occurs when you are exposed to the remitos of God. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing cometh by the word of God. So, when God speaks, when, not, uh, not, see, not the letter, not the graphe. This is not even the logos. This is what we call the graphe. It's just the written word. The logos is the concept of God behind the written word. And in the remer is the specific word that God is saying per time. Amen. If you want to learn more, sign up for Bible college. Amen. <laughs> just joking. <laughs> that was bad, wasn't it? I, yeah, it's horrible. I'm just joking, but I'm trying to run somewhere. When God says something, it could be something from the Bible, but when God breathes on it in your hearing, faith is born. So if you want faith, what you need to do is meditate on what God has said. Whether he said it in scripture or he said it in your quiet time, or he prophesied it through a prophet or a pastor or whoever, if you meditate on what God has said, it will create faith by itself. Can I repeat myself? If you meditate, if you extract, if you marinate, if you ruminate 
on something that proceeded from the mouth of God, it will produce faith by itself. Did you catch that? So when the Bible says we have better promises that are able to make us divine, what do you think we should do with those promises? Meditate on them. And as we meditate on the promises, the faith of God begins to rise in us and then the promise is actualized. And this is why many Christians never work in the promises of God. Because they never take the time to meditate. Someone say meditate. Never. Many of us don't even know what these promises are. This year, I said it before, 2014, I'll say it again. Go through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and make a note of every single thing God has promised, what you need to do to get it, and how you need to, what you need to do to maintain it. It will shock you. Amen? Oh, but pastor, it, wouldn't that make me... Uh, 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 a prosperity Christian, no, it will not to make you. In fact, the Bible says it is the goodness of God that leads to repentance. By his mercies, I beseech you that you present your body. If you are conscious of what God has made available for you, its effect will be the opposite. It will make you want to live right. Amen. Because you will find out that the sins you commit to meet your needs inordinately, you don't need to commit you find that God has a plan to give you the things you want that you're doing foolish things to get. For instance, if you're sleeping with some idiot because he says he loves you, amen, you'll find out that God has plenty of love for you without dropping your underwear. Amen. And it's quiet now. Amen. If you're, if you're forging stuff because you're broke, if you're lying to collect benefits while working on the side, You'll find out God has a plan for your prosperity. You will need... Oh, sorry. You all you ain't ready to hear what I got to say tonight. Amen. So someone say faith is the process by which I extract the promises of God. So say promises of God. So when God makes a promise to me, whether he makes it at the watch night service at your church by prophecy, hint, hint, 2014 should be a year of, a year of, how many of you have taken the time to meditate on that promise? But then December comes, Lord, I didn't see any ascension because you, 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 you. hello, the Bible says, behold, I do a new thing. Say behold. There must be a beholding before the new thing can happen. Hello. Someone say behold. Behold what? Behold the promise of a new thing. Wait, watch with expectation. See, but our faith is impossible to please God. See, if you read the Bible, see, God is more interested in being believed than being obeyed. Are you aware? Because it's impossible to believe him without obeying him. But you can obey him without believing him. There is something about, see, most of the time, what we call spirituality is just doubt and unbelief. Well, whatever will be, will be. I still praise him anyway. No, 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 no. I mean, why would I praise a God who told me a lie? Hello? Why would I praise a God who's not able to keep his promise? Why would I worship a God who can be trusted? I mean, God is all powerful, amen. But let's assume he wasn't all powerful. I could manage a God who couldn't do everything, but I would not manage a God who could not do what he promised. Does that make sense? I could live with God not being all powerful, but I couldn't live with him not being integrous. Can I repeat myself? Does anybody agree with me? Because of my love for him, if I, God forbid, it will never happen. But if I hypothetically were to wake up one day in a parallel universe. And I found out that God was a very powerful person but with limits. I'd still love him. He's done too much for me, for me not to love him. If I found out he's been lying to me, it's a different matter entirely. 
Many times our acceptance of the status quo is not spirituality. It exposes our doubt and unbelief. True faith, like Mary says, how shall these things be? I, I, I taught, I taught uh, at Bible College a few months ago. We looked at the difference between Zechariah's statement when he says, how will it happen? And Mary's statement. If you look at the Greek, they were saying two different things. Zechariah was saying, this is impossible. Mary was saying, show me the process. Hello. Zechariah was saying, this doesn't make sense. Mary was saying, I don't see what I must do. Hello. Zechariah said, God, this can't happen. Mary said, God, show me what I should do. To make it happen. And that's why the angel, the same angel responded differently. To one he says, since you don't believe. To the other he says, the power of the most high shall overshadow you. Look at the difference. Even after Zechariah was made dumb, he still didn't believe. I would have said, I'll I'm, I'm, have made a sign. I, I, as soon as Mary was, as soon as God explained to Mary what her part was. He didn't give her all the details, but he said, your job is to allow the Holy Ghost overshadow you. Allow the power of the Most High to come upon you. Mary said, be it unto me. Zechariah said, nah, anybody got time for that? Faith is the process by which you, someone say activate. And you don't need to work it up. It's not your faith. It's God's faith. It comes. You don't, you don't increase faith in the sense that you have small. No, 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 no. You increase in faith in the sense that you have more. You are more open to the release of God. Faith doesn't. See, you don't have to build faith in the sense that you, know, you build. My, okay, I'm trying to be careful now because I don't want to heresify. But faith comes ready made. Hello. Faith is already molecularly complete. You can have more molecules of faith, but you don't have to construct it. Does that make sense? You get my point? Freak, freak, flay, flay. Faith comes like bricks, hence freak. Faith comes like bricks. You can build the bricks from scratch or you can buy ready-made bricks. Faith comes like ready-made bricks. All you need to do is place one on top of the other. You don't have to take the mortar and the cement and mix and put in the brick maker and pull down and leave to dry. No, that ain't, that, that ain't how faith works. Are you with me, someone? Someone say, I require faith. I require faith. Say, I require faith. I require faith. That's why the Bible says... This is the victory by which we overcome the world. Even our faith. Are you with me? Are you with me? Someone say faith. Okay. But that, I'm not even going about, I'm, that Faith is not my, 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 my destination today. So now that I know that God has offered me better promises. Now that I know that these promises mean I can walk at his level on the earth. Meaning... Whatever he is able to accomplish, accomplish and experience is my birthright. Now that I know I need to find out these promises and meditate on them till it builds faith in me. Let me show you one of these promises. I want to say just one. Now, the new creation amongst other things. One of the things Jesus did when he died and resurrected was restore us. Someone say restore us. Hallelujah. Can I use this one? Why? Uh, uh, when the battery dies, I'll swap. I just like this one. It's all reliable. It's uh, we're emotionally attached. One of the things. Let's take my my gain up a little bit. One of the things Jesus did, or one of the components of salvation, was he came to restore man to man's original place in God pre-fall. He did more than that. He didn't just put us back in Adam. He put us in Adam and then some. But one of the things he did was to reverse the effect of the fall. Someone say reverse the effects of the fall. 
Where are you going? Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Sit down. You need to hear this. You need to hear this. So I'll say reverse the effects of the fall. Come with me to Genesis 1, my favorite chapter. You know, I, 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 I don't have many favorites, but honestly, Genesis 1 is my favorite chapter in the Bible. You know why? I can preach for a decade on Genesis 1. I can preach four times a week, 52 weeks a year, 10 years a decade on Genesis 1. And I wouldn't even begin to scratch. There is an anointing on my life for Genesis 1. I don't understand. There's just an anointing. anointing. There's an anointing. Preachers, you need to understand your lane. Genesis 1 is my lane. Every time I go into Genesis 1, I see something deep. Now, bear in mind our, our, our train of thought. They're better promises. They give us access to a divine nature. We access them by faith. Someone say, I have better promises. They will make me divine. Can you, you have, you, can you say that without being worried? Did the Bible say it? In the Bible? Give you, make you partake of 2 Peter 1 chapter, 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 3, 4, 5, about 5. Make you partakers of a divine nature and you access these promises by faith. One more time, say, I have better promises. They will make me divine. I access them by faith. One more time, I have better promises. They make me divine. I access them by faith. One more time. I want you to shout. I have better promises. They make me divine. I access them by faith. For the final time. I have better promises. They make me divine. I access them by faith. Let's look at one of these promises. Genesis chapter 1. Notice the promises give you a divine nature. Meaning the promises of God are to make you like God. Hello. Genesis 1, 27. 27 yes, 26, sorry. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. Dominion is a quality of God, isn't it? Isn't it? In fact, there is a colon after likeness, meaning the fact that we are in his image and in his like or after his likeness is what qualifies us. Someone say qualifies us. Is what qualifies us. Someone say qualifies us. Say I am qualified to have dominion because I am in God's image and I am after his likeness. So dominion is a function of his nature. So this is one promise. But that's not even the promise I want to show you tonight. But this promise in itself is cool, isn't it? For those of you who run away from spiders, you are, you are, you are disgracing the dominion mandate on your life. I don't care whether you're male, female, in, there's no in between in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you're afraid of dogs, cats. When I, I caught a hold of this in 2005, I keep saying this. I don't run away from barking dogs. I've seen, I've seen dogs that look like they would tear human beings apart. Barking, I mean, I've walked up to them and then they whimper and move back. Some of them run away because they know that I know I have dominion. Bees, I've seen bees and wasps around me. I'm like, get out. Let's tell them, get out of my room now. And it'll go because it knows I have dominion. Now, it doesn't work for you because you don't know. And if you hear what I say today and you try it for the first time, it might not work because you might know it in your head, but you haven't developed faith for it. You haven't meditated on it. But if you meditate on your dominion long enough, it will be insulting to you that a spider can get you off your hiney. You know what I mean by off your hiney? And you jump and land on your bum because of a spider. If you understand this, that you have dominion over everything, the Bible says that creeps, crawls, and flies. There is no mode of demonic transportation. There is no demon on the surface of the earth that doesn't walk, crawl, or fly. Are you with me? Talk to me, someone. Are you with me? 
but that's not even the promise. Go meditate. This is a free one. Meditate on this one when you get home. This is the promise I want to look at very quickly. Bearing in mind, I spoke about winning souls, about reproducing in the kingdom. Amen. Amen. Now, I want to show you why I have no doubt that by the end of this year, you'll need one-on-one service. Now, I'm not prophesying. I'm informing you. There's a difference. I'm not prophesying. I'm informing you. The only way you will not get there is if you ignore what I'm about to preach. I'm not just in church. That's how I know that those of you who run businesses, who are in school, those of you who are married, who have children, it, that, are you aware that it is, in, it is against the law of nature for an organism not to, not, not to reproduce? Infertility is abnormal. In, in nature. True? True? Can I repeat myself? It is abnormal. Someone say abnormal. abnormal. It is abnormal for anything in creation not to multiply. The lack of reproduction shows there is a problem. Come on, talk to me. One of the characteristics of a living thing is it multiplies. Talk to me, talk to me. It's quiet now. You guys, are, your faith is shaking, isn't it? Let me help you solidify it. Are you the body of Christ? Is the body of Christ a living thing? Should it multiply? The reason why it doesn't is we don't apply faith to the promise. The Bible says the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. It's the smallest seed, but it grows to become the biggest tree. Jesus says, Pastor Blessing, that when you plant seed, you should expect either 30, 60. Hey, wait, listen to me, listen, 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 listen. Jesus says that when you plant seed, 30 fold is a bad harvest. Can I repeat myself? 30 fold is the minimum biblical standard. Somebody say minimum. minimum. That's a bad harvest. Hello. Let me explain what a fold is. I've said this before. The word fold is geometrical progression, not arithmetical. It means times two raised to the power 30 over the lifetime of the seed. Are you with me? Are you a seed? Are you a seed? The Bible says you are Abraham's seed amen unless a corn of wheat falls to the ground and dies it abides alone we had one seed called jesus two billion professing harvests professing let's take a tenth of that 200 million that's a good crop isn't it alive today forget those who have lived for the last two thousand years not a talk of 60 fold and 100 fold so why is it that churches and ministries who claim to be the body of Christ struggle to reproduce? One, because there's a warfare in the spirit against it. Two, because we don't understand it's a promise. I want to say promise. Notice I said I have no doubt. Because if it doesn't work, it means God lied. Unless you don't work it. Unless I say you, because I'm going to be working it in my own little corner of the woods. Amen? Amen? Come with me to verse 28. And God blessed them. Someone say blessed. blessed. Are you blessed? The Bible says that if you are in Christ, then you are blessed. Someone say blessed. blessed. The blessings of Abraham have come upon you. God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, have dominion. 
These are the mandates upon the life of a believer, the life of a church, the life of the body of Christ at large. So I want to say be fruitful. Say produce. Say be multiply. Say, or say multiply, sorry. Increase. There's a difference between production and increase. Fruitful talks about what you do. Multiplication talks about how many you are. Then replenish means put the world the way it should have been. So replenish Sheffield from alcoholism, from prostitution, from violence, from, 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 from occultism, from Masonism, from, 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 from teenage delinquency, from, from economic bankruptcy. But that, that's now, that's replenishing. Subdue means that there's stuff that you have to fight. Means put under your feet, put the devil under your feet, put demonic powers under your feet, put secular humanism under your feet, put, can I say it? Can I be real? Put Islam under your feet, put false religion under your feet, amen? Amen. And then dominion means rule. When you put it under your feet, when you replenished and you've put it under your feet, then rule, meaning maintain it, keep it the way it should be, call the shots. But notice, you can't replenish, you can't subdue, and you cannot have dominion. If you have not been fruitful and multiplied. So God says be fruitful. And this is where the first, this is the first point of failure. I'm going to close in three, four minutes. Without fruit, there can't be multiplication. You can't multiply if you don't do what you should do. If you don't pray. You know, and I, I gave them in, in Nottingham three components of winning souls. Prayer, relationship, impartation. Intercession, relationship, impartation. Someone say prayer. prayer. Say prayer. prayer. Say prayer watch. Prayer. Okay. Say relationship. relationship. Say life group. Life group. Say impartation. impartation. Say evangelism. Impartation. Say QED. QED. Say my church is so nice. Is so nice. It simplified it for me. Right. So simple. Your church is so nice. It's made it very simple for you. That, that, that's it in a nutshell that's the, that's, that's the strategy pray interact impart that's how you win souls that's how you make disciples you war in prayer you build re connections and relationships you present the gospel after the gospel you present teaching healing deliverance you know as the amen that's being fruitful and if you do that, you will see fruit, meaning there will be the results. But it says multiply. Look at me, look at me. Are you aware? Pastor Bless and Pastor Yemi, hear me. Are you aware that it is a sin? The Bible says, he that knoweth what to do and does not do it to him, it is sin. The word sin simply means anything that violates the instruction of God. Was that an advice? What was it? Are you aware that you are disobeying an instruction if you don't multiply? Look at me, everybody. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Look at me. I want you to go back and meditate on this. See, I, I saw this this week. That's how, and, and you, know, you know how I saw it. There's nothing about being in a position to make you see <laughs> There's no substitute for experience. <clears throat> so here I am talking to God about the fact that it's about time to pack my bags and go to London, amen, and start from scratch. So I'm like, God, let's talk, amen. For the last six months, I've been enjoying myself, amen. I haven't been a pastor for at least six months. I've just been chilling, you know. You know. <laughs> now I'm about to go back into the, into the, in, into the arena and I'm not just going back into the arena. I'm going back to start from zero. I'm not going back to the churches I left. I'm going back to start another one from scratch. Are you with me? I'm not going back. To, I'm going back. To, I'm going to London, another city where, you know, and I'm not going with billions of pounds or even thousands of pounds. I'm going with me, my wife, my son, us three, with the Holy Ghost, us four, and no more. So like God, I need a word from you, <laughs> you know. You know, and, uh, and I, I like, you know, now I see how Pastor Bless and Pastor Shepherds feel. <laughs> and interestingly, God said this to me, quite interestingly. God said that I'm going to use your journey. So in, in, a, in a nutshell, what you find to face, I will teach you to overcome. Then I want you to pass the information over. 
So, amen. Someone say front line. Amen. But this thing hit my spirit like a spear. It is a wicked God who gives you an instruction that you cannot obey. It is a wicked God who gives you an Now, okay, let me take that back. No, I won't take it back. God gave the law to the Old Testament saints. He gave them the law for a purpose. He didn't start out by giving man a law. The law came to demonstrate to man his inadequacies and to reveal to him the need of a savior. But in the New Testament, he has given grace to obey the New Testament law, not the Old Testament one. New Testament law is very simple. Love God, love people. Someone say love God. Say love people. Say it can't be any simpler than that. Say love God. Love yourself because... It says love your neighbor as yourself. So there's an implied instruction to love yourself. Love God, love yourself, love people. Simple. But there is grace in that instruction that covers all the Old Testament ones. If you fulfill that instruction by grace, you'll be fulfilling them all. God would not ask you to do something that you couldn't do. Even the Old Testament law could be kept. A man kept it. His name was Jesus. Amen. He was fully man, just anointed by the Holy Spirit. Even the rich young ruler came to Jesus and says, all these things I have kept for my youth. Think about it. A human being came and told Jesus, I have not broken the Mosaic law from my youth. Difficult, but possible. Amen. So is it possible? With the help of God. God commands us to multiply now this doesn't just apply to the to to to, to, to ministry ministerial growth are you aware that sammy your business is commanded to multiply are you aware are you aware that it's an instruction and god doesn't just say multiply he says multiply till you replenish the earth so the boundaries of your multiplication are determined. That's why you should not be unhappy or discouraged when you see adverse conditions around you. Because you are, com you are commanded to multiply until you subdue the adversity around you. So for instance, how, how, how far is a church permitted to multiply? As far as they are unbelievers and unbelieving believers. The moment you run out of people who have not been submitted to the kingdom, that you can't multiply anymore. How far have you been permitted to multiply business-wise? As far as there is a need for your... Does that make sense? So stop looking at, oh, well, nobody's buying this. That's exactly why you should do that business. Because nobody's buying it. Amen. Or everybody is buying a product that is inferior and God has given you a quality idea for a better product. And once your better product hits the market, amen, then it will be unfair for everybody else to deal with substandard goods. But I want to focus now for the next two minutes and I'm done on the house of God. Someone say commandment. You are commanded, house of Ecclesia, to multiply. You don't have a choice. Amen. It is abnormal. Someone say abnormal. It is, see, it is disgusting to God that you don't multiply. Because God's kingdom is banking on the fact that you multiply. Not multiply by members, no. Multiply by quality disciples. To multiply means to produce yourself. Now, can you imagine if they, that is a hundred, there's almost, there's almost a million people, about 800, 900,000 people in Sheffield and environments, if you add the suburbs like, like Rotherham or whatever. Can you imagine what 900 crazy folk like you would look like? Can you imagine what Sheffield would look like if there were 900 Sammies? 900 commons, or 900,000 commons, sorry. 
900,000 Chris's, 900,000 Natasha's. No matter how bad you think you are, no matter how, see, no matter how horrible you might think you are, I can guarantee you this city would not be worse off if everybody was like you. Can we agree on that? Chris, no matter how messed up you might think you are, I can guarantee you there is at least 100,000 people in this city worse than you. Would you agree? If everybody was like you, there'd be, have you raped anybody or are you currently raping anybody? Forget what you were before. Okay. Are you currently stealing from anybody? Are you currently shooting anybody? Are you currently uh, 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 committing any occultic activity? So can you imagine if we re- replace all these kinds of people with you? And you're still getting better around you. Okay. So imagine where you'll be in 20 years. Imagine 900,000 people like you. Ha. Someone say faith. Now, some of you are struggling. I want you to look around this room. Look around, look around, look around, look around this room, look around this room. Are you aware that if, see, everybody's not here today. Is everybody here today? Okay, it's a Wednesday. It's a January. You know, that's when you know it's cold. That's when you know those who are going far in God. Everybody put your, everybody put your hands together for yourself. Now, let's assume that this was all there was of you. If you doubled every month for a year, how many would you be? Yes. Imagine just doubling every month. That's all. One person wins one person to Christ that stays in the kingdom every month. Just one. I mean, that's hardly revival, is it? One soul per month is not revival, is it now? Is, it, is, that, is, is that your idea of a revival? No. But just imagine doubling every month. Let's assume there was two of you, and there's a lot more than two. Amen. For those who are listening by CE, there's a lot more than two. But listen to me, it was just Pastor, 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 Pastor Blessed and Pastor Yemi. So, at the end of January, you'd be four. At the end of February, you'd be eight. At the end of March, you'd be 16. April, 32. May 64, June 128, July 256, August would be 6, no, 256 times 2 is, 256 times 2 is, that's 4 plus, so that would be 512. Uh, August, you would be 124, 1024. September, you would be 2048. Uh, uh, October, you would be 4,096. Uh, 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 in November, you would be 8,182, or 92, sorry, 8,192. So, by December, if two people, starting with two people at the beginning of the year, if you doubled every month by December, you'd be almost 17,000. 16,300, just under 6,200 or something. Just, just, just picture that. Now let's assume half of the people disappear. Let's assume four out of every five people as you multiply disappear. What's four out of five times times sixteen thousand? That's still that's a mega church, isn't it? Isn't that a mega church? Isn't that a mega church? That's still over. That's about two. Oh, that's about that's about three thousand something. But if I told you that you would have three thousand members by the end of the year, what would you say to me? Would you sow a seed in advance? <laughs> I'm just joking. Look at me, 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 look at me. You know why it sounds difficult? Because you don't have faith. You know why you don't have faith? Because you haven't meditated on the promises. And the Bible says faith without works is dead, being alone. When you are done meditating, let the faith you have received cause you to act. Stand with me, stand with me.
The lease on this building ends in three years. I used to think it'd be nice to keep it. I've changed my mind. I want to be in a hurry to hand it back in three years. Amen? In fact, by the time one year is over, I, I would love this to be just one big prayer center. All it takes, you see, if every single one of you, forget doubling, one, three people, one, three souls this year, and then you were done. You won three souls and then you were done. Each of your three souls won another three and then they quit. Does that make sense? This is you, you just win three and you retire. Do you know where we would be? I am sick and tired of hearing about how there are demonic forces keeping the kingdom of God from expanding. Because the Bible tells us that the gates of hell shall not prevail. Amen. So the gates of hell shall not prevail. Say they shall not prevail. They shall not prevail. Now, to prevail means there must be a confrontation. So God is right. One way or the other, they won't prevail. If we don't fight, they won't prevail because they won't need to prevail. Amen. And that's what's happening right now. Nobody's fighting. Or very few people in the body of Christ are fighting. But God promises that if you engage the gates of hell, they will not prevail. Now I want you, so next time you invite people to church, next time you witness on the street, I want you to meditate. Next time you evangelize to friends and loved ones or strangers, I want you to take the time to meditate on the fact that God promises you to be fruitful and multiply. Can you do that? Lift up your mouth and pray. Come on. Take, take five seconds and say, Father, I believe. My brain might be struggling, but my spirit believes. Sammy, your choir should multiply. Ben and Jermaine, your media team should multiply. Come on now, someone talk to me. Revive should multiply. Your life group should multiply. Your evangelism team should multiply. Namunji, your ushers should multiply. I mean, every, see, every living creature multiplies. It's the way of life. The church is an organism with the life of God on the inside. Say, Father, we will multiply. Come on, open your mouth. Begin to declare. I want you to declare out loud. Come on, pray, pray, pray. Say, Lord, this year, the year of ascension, we will multiply for your kingdom. Open your mouth and pray. Say, we will multiply. We take, come on, I want to hear you pray. Like I said, pray about a Bentley or Rolls Royce. Like I said, pray about your husband or wife or money in the bank. Say, God, we will multiply for the kingdom. We will multiply for the kingdom. In the rabba, sondo rabba sata. Father, we receive the mandate of heaven's kingdom to multiply in the name of Jesus. Come on now, come on. We will come on. Come on, come on. Jondo roko sondo roko sinda rababata. Say, Lord, I will multiply for your kingdom. Say, I will produce fruit. I will produce a harvest. You will use me. Come on, tell God. You will use not just my pastor, not just my youth group leader, not just my, my usher or my ushering leader or head of the department or my choir leader, but I, you will use my hands for battle. You will use my tongue for battle. You will cause me to bring a harvest to your kingdom this year in the name. Come on now, somebody pray, pray. God, you will cause me to bring a harvest this year in the name of Jesus. 
Father, I decree, I stand in the office of a prophet tonight, and I decree that there is exponential, mind-boggling, boat-sinking, net-breaking, expansion and multiplication, sustainable multiplication coming to this house this year. As a whole, in families, in businesses, in ministries, in departments, in life groups, in, 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 in jobs, in careers, in education, in every aspect of your people's lives. Let the spirit of multiplication hit. Send the spirit of multiplication. Send the spirit of multiplication. Send the spirit. We give you thanks. We give you praise. Come on, somebody say, I receive the spirit of multiplication. Say after me, I receive the spirit of divine multiplication. We will multiply. This house will multiply. My house will multiply. My life will multiply. All that concerns me will multiply. All that concerns me will multiply. Say, Lord, all that concerns me will multiply. I will win souls. I will profit your kingdom. I see a harvest of men and women, boys and girls, coming to the kingdom through this house. Father, we will double over and over again geometrically till we have no room to contain we give you thanks we give you praise in the awesome name of jesus amen now before you sit down let me give you oh, sit down sit down before we close let me give you some quick tips on how to make this happen now this principles apply to every area of your life but i'm going to use them about god's house so I want to say faith is a substance of things hoped for. So I must first hope for faith to activate. Every Sunday, every Wednesday, every revive, every live group, every time you gather, I want you to expect increase. Don't just expect it when you get there. Spend the week expecting it. Amen? Amen. Sammy, every week I want you to imagine your... You're, so basically, Sam, look at me, look at me. From Monday to Tuesday, from Thursday to Saturday, I want you to spend thinking, Lord, who are you going to send to church today who's going to join the choir? Namunji, who are you going to send to church today who's going to join the ushering team? Pastor Blessing, Pastor Yemi, who are you going to send to church today, period. <laughs> ben, Jermaine, who are you going to send? Is it gonna, you know, does that make sense? Tasha, who are you going to send? You get what I'm trying to make. Expect it. Who's going to get saved? Chris, God, who is going to come to revive today for the first time? When we go evangelizing, who are we going to meet? Are you with me? You must first become obsessed. Somebody here say obsessed. Not in an ungodly way. Not to build a kingdom. I, I'm, I'm not joking. I'm not joking. I'm serious. Not, not, not for your own selfish reason. But I've just given you a good reason. 900,000 of you will leave Sheffield in a lot better condition than it is now. Even at your worst right now. Because someone say obsessed. Are you aware God was obsessed with multiplication? He was so obsessed he gave his own son. Anything you are ready to kill your own child for must be an obsession. Can I repeat myself? Anything you are ready to die for in the place of Christ must be an obsession. He was so obsessed with gaining sons and daughters. He sacrificed the one he had. You have to become obsessed. In a godly kingdom way. It should, you should leave, breathe, sleep, eat. Every waking moment of your life, you should expect multiplication in every area, but especially in this one. Secondly, say pray. Say call forth. You take the promises of God like Paul told Timothy, you war with them. So you don't just expect it. You sow it in the place of prayer. Amen. And then out of the, when you're obsessed with something and you've prayed about it, it becomes easier to act. The reason why it's hard to do the things we should do to see this come to pass is, one, we're not obsessed by it. 
Oh, evangelism. Oh, well, all right. Pastor Blessing won't put me down in his black, in his black book if I don't come today. So, yeah, here I am. Let's go. Whatever. But if you've been thinking about it all week, you've been praying about it, God's been infusing your spirit with strategies and ideas and expectations and a burden, then you become like a cocked gun, like a pulled back arrow. The moment you are released, boom. Amen. Amen. Somebody say expect. Say pray. Say act. It really is that simple. Say expect. Same thing with financial multiplication. Become obsessed in a godly way. In a godly way now. In a godly way. With seeing the last of poverty. Think, think blessing. Think prosperity. Every, see, when you open, when you put your, you know, your Gary or your Sadza or whatever it is, you know, I don't know what you call it now in your language, but when you put it in your mouth, you should be surprised to chew it and find Gary. You should expect to crunch down on some chicken. Does that make sense? When you get in the bus and you're rolling around town, you should be expecting, see, when you open your eyes and the bus stops and you have to get off a bus, you should almost fall down because you should assume you're getting out of a limo. Does that make sense? When you look in the mirror and you look at your, you know, your 50 pound as the suit, you should be shocked because all day long while you are, and I have one 50 pound as the suits before, amen. I still have one or two of them in my wardrobe. I'm being honest, you know, despise not the days of humble beginnings. You should be shocked because while you were walking around all day, you should have been assuming you were wearing the best. Then you begin to pray about it. And while you pray, God will purify your greed. And make it godly. Prayer doesn't just give you what you want. It purifies your motive for having it. If you pray in his name. And then finally, when you have been living in a mentality of prosperity and you have word for it in prayer when the opportunities to make money comes you won't be lazy are you with me when the business opportunity the investment opportunity comes you someone say pray say pray first of all say expect say pray say work pastor b um, I'll be here next week. I want to see this working. Amen. I want to see double the usual Wednesday crowd. Okay, I might not be here next week. But whenever I'm back. Amen. Not because you begged your housemaid, please come with me to church today. My pastor will kill me. No, but see, it, just trust me. This might sound so, well, well, yeah, but it works. So it works. It works. And, and finally, Pastor B, as leaders or as a leader, it is your responsibility to ingrain this in your people. One of the signs of a great leader is that he can get you to do something he himself can't. Good coaches are great at motivating you to do stuff they themselves can't do. A leader is not the best person at doing it. He's the best person at organizing for it to get done. And I, I, God began to show me that's why the, the, the name it, claim it bunch. That's why they grow. They've taken God's principle and used it wrong. Have you seen some church where you're thinking, are oh, these guys real? Oh, we're so excited. Oh, it, it's all so flowery and buttery. You know, everything. So now while that in itself is bad, but... There's nothing wrong with creating an environment of expectation and, and excitement and zeal and passion. And, and, and if people can be passionate about becoming rich, can we be passionate about seeing revival? Every time we come to church, we're excited to see who's going to show up, who's going to get saved, we're drunk and is going to fall in and fall out under the power, amen? Then you'll be excited to bring your friends because you know God will touch them. Are you with me? You know why? Because we're not hoping it will happen. We have paid the price for it. Father, I've given your instruction, given your word. 
confirm it this year. Confirm it. We give you thanks and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Somebody put your hands together for God.